Okay, today on the show, we are chatting with Charlie Watson. Charlie, welcome to the show. AKA Runner Beans. Yes. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I guess we should start there. What's the Instagram handle all about? So when I made it, I didn't realize that Americans don't have runner beans. Like it's a type of bean here. It's literally oh. like a green bean um, that are very popular. People have them growing in their gardens. You can buy them in the supermarket. Um, so in the UK, it's like a play on words about the bean and running and yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I didn't realize it wasn't it wasn't a thing there. Yeah, we've got. That just just blew my mind. Did you know that? I didn't. We've got jelly beans. (laughs) Kind of similar. Yeah, (laughs) except for ours are candy. Um, So yeah, so you're over in England. Yep. Do you do you ever run into our friend Forty Runs? No, we're on very opposite sides of London. Like you're on the good side. (laughs) (laughs) I I grew up in West London, so I'm going to say yeah, West is best, but. I know that that will be controversial. Well, the only geography I know about London, other than running through it, was uh, the Pet Shop Boys, West End Girls and East End Boys. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Megan, you have no idea what no, I'm talking about. No idea. All right. Do you do you know that song? Yep. Okay, good. At <laughs> least one of you. <laughs> um. So you wear a lot of hats right now, and you know, for a long time, you're a registered dietitian. I know you authored a cookbook, you're a mom, you're a wife, you're a runner. How do you feel about the title influencer? Don't love it. I feel like every time I use it, I use like inverted commas, like quote unquote influencer. Um, I've heard people say it's, you know, you're actually just someone that's influential. I don't even know about that. I feel like I just um, share my story. And if people resonate with it, then great. If it's part of a you know a kind of community building it's part of meeting other people meeting other runners globally um rather than it feeling like I'm influencing people to do things maybe encouraging or like motivating or um inspiring rather than influencing I think I think where it comes down to and tell me if I'm wrong here when you hear the term influencer it seems contrived like you are doing things to influence people it's an action like you're intentionally creating content to influence people doing quote-unquote ads uh like that may not be fully genuine um and i think that's where at least for us i think that's where we hate not hate the term that's strong but don't it like cringe a little bit if someone calls us an influencer because like what we're doing is genuine and Mm -hmm. and if we don't like a product, we're not going to be like, okay, let's bring them on as a sponsor so that we can get some cash um, or, you know, that kind of thing. So is that where you would cringe from that term? Yeah, I think it's just there's been so many negative um, connotations now with the, the term influencer where you kind of see people. Um, have you seen the influencers in the wild Instagram posts where you see people kind of like, dancing around doing cringy things and I'm sure <laughs> my husband cringes every time I ask him to take a photo or you know, the thought of me setting up a self-timer taking a running photo um but yeah I think it's the idea that it's like that it was started or I, I guess I get the idea of like somebody calling themselves an influencer that maybe that's that they've started an account to get paid to do something whereas mine was a genuine sharing my Instagram and blog is what it actually started with as a way of raising money and awareness for a charity when I ran the London Marathon 10 11 years ago and I think that's I always remember that's why I've started and it's just been a a kind of organic growth through me growing as a runner and as a person through my 20s and into my 30s and the account and the blog has developed alongside that yeah first off i love your accent i could listen to you all day yeah two like you should read a book like you should (laughs) just get hired to read books but um secondly that's something we have in common like i I believe in the run started because i was raising money for uh the baltimore child abuse center and Yeah, so it, our our humble beginnings. Similar paths. Sorry, mm-hmm. it was funny because I was like, uh, please donate money. And then I'd be like, these are the shoes I'm running in to train for. And the, 
uh, obviously people could care less about <laughs> helping the charity as much as they want to know, well, are those shoes good for that? And so I started just kind of like giving little reviews of shoes and it blossomed from there. So is that kind of like you started off doing the charity and people started asking you more and more questions about your no. journey? I feel like it was my friends being like, we don't care. Please call <laughs> someone else. <laughs> um, they, they were like, cool. So we've sponsored you. You've run your marathon. We came, we cheered, we went to the pub afterwards. Like it's done now. Right. And I yeah, was shut like, up. <laughs> no, I'm going to do another one. And so it was almost finding community through that, that actually did care um, or did want to talk about it or, you know, discuss Garmin watches and splits and this sort of thing. Whereas my friends were like, cool. So is that another Friday you're not coming out and you're, cause you're running in the morning. Ah, uh, I didn't even think about that, that they, these were non-running friends. They're like, great. Yeah. You ran a marathon. Terrific. So, um, what was your charity? Mind, which is a mental health charity here. I, I ran it in memory of a friend from university. So it was very, something very, emotional something very kind of close to my heart and close to a lot of people that knew him and that you know that my friends that, I, that were sponsoring me had known my friend Vic okay. for five years and or at the time he was I went to uni with him and he died at the end of our um three years in Leeds and it was about two or three years later that I ran the marathon in his memory Okay. And had you been a runner before? Nope. <laughs> I didn't know. So actually that's kind of crazy. I, yeah. I didn't know how far a marathon was. I was just like, I know I want to do something huge <laughs> and terrifying and that will be a positive way to deal with this grief. And that was going to be something to get people talking because I think mental health in men in particular is just, it's definitely talked about more now than it was 15 years ago, but it, it still needs to, it's something that I'm not going to ever stop talking about, you know, mental health and sharing that because I think that when you're alone in it, everything feels worse. What's kind of crazy, Megan, if you think about it, like mental health and running, we were talking about this, even with our, our pet, uh, that how much running actually helps you deal with, so, like it's not going to cure mental health but being active and doing something that you can be proud of and setting a routine and feeling a sense of accomplishment, it does end up helping with people mentally. At least that's my belief. And you weren't a runner before this. Yeah. Like has it opened your eyes to what a great tool physical activity is to mental health? Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I always, I feel like other than at university where I just sort of partied, I always was <laughs> and things, but, but I feel like, more so now I use it because it's like escaping from technology I'm not on social media or looking at emails it's you're outside most of the time and of I try and be outside as much as possible I run next to the water I find it really calming and that side of things helps with kind of the mental health side of things that you're then taking in nature you're away from technology you're maybe away from other people and it can just be some like quiet time I don't, I often actually um, switch off, like I don't listen to podcasts, I don't listen to music when I'm needing that space and can just zone out. Or I listen to like an audio book and just kind of get away from the world for a bit. So once you decide that you're going to run this marathon for the charity, what's, what, how do you even begin to start training? Did you hire a coach? Like what did all that look like? It's very embarrassing. I literally hired a <laughs> trainer to run with me because I just didn't know how you even started running. So this guy would come and run 5K with me. And then I was like, this is really expensive. Um, <laughs> what a great and, gig though. Yeah. <laughs> um, he was pretty like, although I think I walked, I complained. Um, I remember it was really icy one day and we had just had to run in like circles on a patch of grass. Um, and I found running blogs and that's how I found a Hal Higdon training plan that I downloaded for free. It was like the super novice idiot's guide to running a marathon <laughs> with one mile. And yeah, I started devouring running blogs and food blogs and trying to kind of eat better and exercise and do a little bit more than just run. I mean, I did basically just run in that, that um, 
kind of period and it led to when I first attempted to run the marathon I got injured and so the second bout of marathon training to actually run the marathon I was a little bit more strategic in terms of going to the gym doing some strength training going to some other classes but yeah I kind of from being this not a runner not interested in running thought runners were weird to I'm the weird runner now all I read is running blogs and want to talk about running and yeah it's the worst feeling when you realize that you're in the clutches of running when you go to a party and you no longer can talk to people about like you can't think of a subject that's not running and you're like um yeah so what do you do when you're not at work mm. Yeah, I have no idea how to talk to people who don't run. <laughs> it's, it's embarrassing. Yeah. And it's, you're so excited when you find someone that does run that you can talk. Uh, that's either like training for a marathon. My sister-in-law had to be like, Charlie, please stop talking to me about running when she ran the marathon. <laughs> and I was like, oh, and she's like, oh, I'm just doing this for charity. This is a one and done. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I scan the room for Garmin's or Koros or runner like road IDs. I'm looking and at shoes. Yeah, shoes. I when I go to a barbecue or something, that's the first thing I do is look for anybody wearing a GPS watch. <laughs> Good idea. So once you run this marathon, were you thinking this is gonna be like the one and done thing? Or were you going into this being like, I've I've already fallen in love and I'm gonna keep doing this? I think I thought it was gonna be a one and done and that maybe I'd do like five Ks, ten Ks to stay in shape and go to the gym and do workout classes and it just be a healthier lifestyle rather than what happened was I crossed the finish line and I was like, Mm, that hurt, but I bet I could do it faster next time. <laughs> Every time I cross the marathon, it's either like, Well, that was fun, or I bet I could run that faster, or I want to run that faster. Okay, so you ran, I'm guessing you were running for charity where you're running the London Marathon? Yeah. Okay, so what you finish that, you come across, you, you've already got the buzz, you're like, I've already trained, I'm already ready to run, I'm going to sign up for something else. What was the next marathon? Next marathon was New York, um, <sighs> which was like eight, uh, 18 months later. So it was not a straightaway sign up, it was like, okay, I'll do some half marathons, just kind of stay active and then my friend was like oh my boyfriend's running it and I was like well we should run it too so we bought a there was like a tour operator doing like a bib and flight option and we were yeah. like let's do it um, that's amazing you're gourmet like hitting two majors right off the bat well this is my husband's mistake he <laughs> it, he was bought then boyfriend he came to a wet, miserable 10K run in Richmond Park that I made him come and watch. And he was like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm only watching international marathons. <laughs> <laughs> Game on, right. Uh, partly how it all kind of started. And I know you are a six-star finisher. So when did that come onto the radar of being a goal? That was kind of an accident. I ran, so I ran London, ran New York, and then I ran Berlin, um, which I feel like Berlin is like, for Europeans is not quite as glamorous as maybe it is to Americans. Um, so I ran Berlin and was like, oh, I'm halfway through. I might as well get them all. So of the six, which one's your favorite? And you can't say London because you live there. But uh, <laughs> what, which one's, which, you can say London if it is, but which one's your favorite? I mean, it has to be London because it's like the hometown marathon. I grew up in London. You'll be, I r ran as a pacer one year and I was in Canary Wharf and I just heard like people using my full name that I'd been at school with. Like, you know, it's, you see someone every mile and so that's really special. But then if I can't say London, then New York, because I think it's like, I describe oh. it to people as like, like the London Marathon, but with Americans cheering. So in London, everyone's like, well done. And they're clapping. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little rowdy. <laughs> and then in New York, everyone's like hollering and like being like, I'm so proud of you. And you're like, thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Well, I loved, I loved Tokyo. Mm-hmm. But yeah. you talk about cheering fans. Yeah. That is very quiet. Like you thought London was polite. Tokyo is like super duper polite. Yeah. I feel like I loved 
Tokyo for very different reasons. I loved it because I was looking up. I didn't, I wasn't focused so much on pace there. I was just trying to like kind of absorb the city and the running culture there. And I feel like that's, it's such a different race to any American, mm -hmm. British, European races that I'd ever done before. Um, but it is quiet and it is, I mean, it makes it slightly easier to see your friends and family. So my parents came over and they were very, they had a big Union Jack helium balloon with them. And <laughs> it was really easy to spot them. But oh, that's awesome. Um, that's a yeah. runner's tip for Tokyo right there, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Get your family to bring a giant helium balloon. Yep. And it meant that every Brit in the race would be like, yay. And so yeah. that's parents which would cheer them as well i was surprised i know that it's a major and so you have a lot of people coming in from other countries but i was amazed at the diversity of ethnicities running and and you know patriots from different uh countries running the tokyo marathon i i don't know why i expected it to be mostly you know japanese but it there was there was people from everywhere like i ran into uh brits I ran into people from the Philippines. I ran into people from uh, New York and it, it, everywhere. Just, it was amazing. Did you run it? Was it la like last year? Like this last year. year? This yeah. yeah. I think that's probably even more diversity because of the fact that it had been canceled for international yep. runners and for um, a lot of people traveling in for the last few years. So I feel like maybe... Yeah. Because I, although there were some international runners, I felt like it was mostly Japanese when I ran it. Yeah, I think you're right. And they were saying that it was, well, at the time, at the, it was the Guinness record for six star, six -star finishers. Abbott finishers. So I think that played into it did as Boston well. Did Boston But apparently Boston year? just broke that. So. And then I wonder how London did this year, because they seem to hand out a lot in London this year as well. No, I don't know. I guess for a while, we're going to have it like tallying up, you know, every time. Sure. More and more and more of it. Um, yeah. What was your last one where you got your six star? Tokyo, which I kind okay. of regret a little bit. I just feel like there wasn't as much fanfare as there maybe would have been in <laughs> London or America. I, I kind of wish I'd got it at one of the American ones because I feel like they'd make a bigger deal of it. Um, I felt like the London marathon was incredible because we wore a medal. Like normally America, you wear your medal afterwards and somebody might be like, yeah, congrats or whatever. But London, we got free Your food, royalty over there. we got tables, we got, they treated us like, thank you for coming. Like, you would have thought we won London Marathon, the way we were walking around after yeah. the marathon. Oh, I'm pleased that was your experience. Yeah, we got into restaurants because of our medals, so, so many good things. Um, speaking of London Marathon, it just happened this past weekend. You were, you didn't run, but you were there doing, it seemed like, all sorts of things. And I have to ask because you have a photo with Kipchoge. Yeah. What was that like? <laughs> so no, Kipchoge has a picture with runner beans. True. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, so I was really uh, lucky to get TCS, who sponsored the marathon, gave me a hospitality pass and it got us into the little, um, the kind of finish area, which was the, um, I don't know how to describe it, like the thing above. Leaf. Yeah. yeah, the yeah, tower. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I just walked up there to try and get a, like to watch the women's race, the end of it and get a good, good spot. And I walked up and I saw my friend Robbie who works for London Marathon and I literally nearly launched myself at him because I was so excited to see him. And then I saw who he was standing next to and I was like, thank goodness I didn't just do this. This would have been mortifying. <laughs> and so I whispered to him, I was like, can I get a photo? And he was like, in a minute. So we watched the women's race. So I watched Safan Hassan win next to Kipchoge and then got a photo. And my friend Robbie was like, oh, this is Charlie. We used to run together. We've run loads of marathons and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, hello. <laughs> um, I basically was like, I'm a big fan. <laughs> and then my, I couldn't, didn't say anything else. Because I was like, do you bring up Boston? Do you not? Do you no. <laughs> no. So I didn't. So I, yeah. yeah. And then I just stood there and then I was, I went bright red looked at my photos was like I immediately need to post this on Instagram this is more exciting than anything else that's going to happen to me for the next year um yeah so absolutely made my day 
Yeah, I uh, I know that if I had been there, I would have said something stupid about Boston. Like definitely, you know, oh, sixth place. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I really thought you were going to win, like the rest of the world. <laughs> or like, how are your legs? Or yeah. oh, the hills are steep. Yeah, I just yeah. <laughs> do you, do you take a little time off after the marathon? Like, what do you do? Like, you know, what what do you do for fun? <laughs> yeah, you having a nice time in London? So yeah, I just I went with big fan and then took my turn and didn't say anything else. I was just like, thank you. That's yeah. awesome. Does being in that environment make you want to go out and race another marathon or does it make you happy that you're on just sitting at the finish line? Oh, I mean, I signed up for a race on Saturday night. I was like, <laughs> ah. of just being at the shakeout runs and spending the day with runners. I was like, well, I, I need to do another one. So I actually signed up for Valencia Marathon, ah. which is in December. But I, yeah, I signed up on, on Saturday night in bed. I was like, right, we're doing this. That's too bad she signed up for that. We should have had her come to New York. I know. Um, that's supposed to be a very fast race, right? Yeah, I'm trying to get the, a BQ for 2025. My friends and I have a pact that we're running Boston 2025. So okay. that's my... Yeah, goal. And then it gives me enough time if that goes horribly wrong to do a spring. A reload, which is always fun. Don't think that way, though. Think yeah. that this is your last chance. <laughs> I'll come and cheer New York. I'll come yeah. and be like hype girl. Bring it. I'll bring Kipchoge with me. And, you know, we'll that would be great. Yeah. I would love it if he could give me my medal yeah, at the end. You guys end. could just hand out the medals at the end. Though. Actually, great. yeah, I'd be more excited to get it from you because I know like Kipchoge, I'd just be one other you know, person to him. But you, you'd be like, I know you. Yeah. yeah, I can do that. I can make that happen. All right. I love it. Um, so when did this uh, registered dietitian thing come into play? Was that like part of your school studies or did that come when you started running? Yeah, that came after I started running. So I, I used to work at Good Housekeeping magazine, writing recipes and start food styling. And I started getting into writing about kind of healthy foods and writing healthier recipes as I was learning more just kind of organically about what to you know how to fuel for running and decided there was so much misinformation out there online it was the like the period of the clean eating and where you couldn't have it seemed anything but I was like well this surely can't be what I should be eating as a runner is like no carbs no processed things no white foods like nothing surely this is this is not what I'm being told I fueled my whole first marathon on like jelly babies like jelly beans and Haribo and that sort of thing and so I went back to school did my 40 year degree second degree um and originally I thought I was going to do only sports nutrition and then I worked in a hospital I had to spend nearly a year in a hospital as part of my degree and I absolutely fell in love with clinical nutrition and have been, since I qualified, I've been working in a hospital. Um, I'm on maternity leave at the moment, but have worked in the hospital since qualifying. What, what is the, what is the lure of the clinical dietitian? What was so, like, what pulled you in with that? I think it's because while I was, while I was studying, I was working, doing some freelance work and just doing Instagram and blogging and influencing. You can't see, I've used the... <laughs> Finger quotes. Right on quote, yeah. And I just, I felt so much of your, is your day successful? Is how many people have liked your Instagram post? How many people have given you kind of a pat on the back for going for your run? Whereas working in the hospital, people are so you're so involved with their care and nutrition is such an emotional part of people's treatment that I just found it really rewarding. And so doing that as working as a student, I was thinking how this is going to be even better working as a, you know, qualified dietitian. And so I started working in February, 2020 in a hospital and we all know what happened oh. just after that so it was full on it was not what I was anticipating happening but um yeah it was on intensive care by April 2020 mm. and um yeah worked worked throughout COVID on the 
COVID wards, basically. Well, that's interesting wow. because you've seen like some of the most probably very hard to deal with situations. And you go from that to everybody knows who runs what it's like to be at the finish line of a marathon. So you the extreme difference between those two spots probably give you a lot of perspective on life, I would think. Yeah, I think so. And I think it you you count yourself lucky for every training run that you're able to go on. And I think that just we've all experienced hardships. And I think that especially the first few marathons, first few, but the first marathon I did after um, after COVID, you just look around and think, how lucky am I that I'm here, that I'm allowed to run with other people, that we're allowed to kind of be in this together. And it's that community that I that made me fall in love with running, really. And it's something that I really missed during the months that we were in you know in isolation and weren't allowed to run with other people weren't allowed to gather weren't allowed to be kind of with our people and and I think that that puts it into perspective that you know you've chosen to be here you've chosen to sign up when you're on the hard training runs but that ultimately you're you're in it together in a marathon and I feel like that you know is the on the London Marathon medals is like we finished together and it is very much a community and you can really see that at the the fit the start and finish line of the marathon and and for basically every step along the way of the London Marathon anyway yeah I thought that tagline was a little cheeky but um, <laughs> <laughs> we, um... So you told me that and then it ruined it <laughs> and I thought <laughs> I mean, it does. it's it's that. Um. Anyway, so but I think about human nature, and we talked. We started off with like a, a little bit about uh, mental health, and I think you know you bring it in with the the hospital, and then the finish line thing is we like to come together to grieve, you know, to have the support of other people uh, when we need help to grieve, and then you think about the finish line. We come together when we want to share joy. It's like these extreme emotions. We need, it's not, if you do it by yourself, neither one is as, you know, helpful. But when you get together with all these people, then, you know, it just makes, it amplifies everything. But as a dietitian, and you mentioned the Haribos and the uh, other, uh, I think you called them jelly bellies. Um, <laughs> the, the um, what would be your top three British candies that you would recommend to anybody training for a marathon and uh i don't i also chocolates are included training for a marathon well percy pigs got to be number one <laughs> what is it um, percy pigs <laughs> percy pigs yeah okay all right <laughs> we're gonna have to google I, that i brought some to chicago for megan featherston and she said her kids love them they are like an Marks and Spencers. Everybody knows about Percy Pigs. They are, yeah. Um, what makes pulling them up? What are those? They're they're just like um almost like a gummy worm, but in a pig shape. Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. What's next? Um, for training for the marathon. I mean, it could not. It could just be. It could be your. It could be your cheat snack. Your whatever. Top three British. Uh, what do you call them? Confections. What are, What do they call them over there? Don't they call them boiled sweets? No, boiled sweets would be hard candies. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, um, Percy Pigs. I like a wine gum. Um, and then Colin the Caterpillar, which is like the ultimate. It's a Swiss chocolate Swiss roll with a caterpillar face. Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why everything, all of the British terms make me chuckle. <laughs> Piggly Wiggly. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, um, wow. Okay, so on your Instagram, it says you're helping runners with nutrition, athleisure, and travel tips. How, where did the travel aspect of all of this come into play? So my husband is a pilot, which is a very uh. useful addition to my lifestyle. But um, yeah, he, so he is a commercial pilot and we, I love to travel. I grew up traveling and I love the fact that running is a way that you can see a new place and it can take you somewhere that maybe you haven't 
thought about going before, whether it's for a race or for a just to go for a run. Um, so it's 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 kind of a I've always been traveling, and then since running, there's new places that I want to visit because I want to do a particular race or run there. Um, yeah, I feel like basically all of our money goes straight back to the company that my husband works for because I'm like, let's go here and here and here. <laughs> he's flying for free. Uh, basically, they they don't need to pay him since he's uh, hauling you around. <laughs> Just give it to us in like seats, tickets. Is he with uh, British Airways? Yeah. So can he get me the wings? <laughs> What like the kid ones? The like yeah, I'll take those. <laughs> the <kids. laughs> they don't. They didn't Percy hand them out to me. The New York medal and the wings. Got it. Yeah, we'll have them all together. A custom all right, package perfect. for you. All right. Um, so are you actually helping people with like guidelines on how to travel, or is it more just uh, you're sharing sort of your experiences, or I guess both? Yeah, so it's a combination of the, of the two. So I've like we're trying to help people work out how like the best way for them to run the majors or any of the races that I've done. But in particular, people are interested in the majors. Um, and then I work. I partner with Western Hotels, so Western London City, but globally Western, and they've obviously just taken over as one of the partners of Abbott World Marathon Majors, which is great. So it's a lot of like the London specific was like where to stay, how to get to the start line, where to send your family for spectating, where to eat dinner the night before. Um, we could have used and that. Yeah. I had the Next worst time. fish and chips, worst <laughs> fish and chips in <laughs> England. Like I've had better fish and chips in the U S we went to the wrong place, obviously. And also I told you off for getting Starbucks coffee while you were there. Oh Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and he did anyway. We did, we did go one place that said they had the best coffee in London. Did you see that post that Megan made? She's like, we did it. <laughs> we found the best. Congratulations on the best cup of coffee in London. Um, is, so is all of your travel basically around races or running, or do you guys actually travel on quote-unquote vacations? We definitely go on vacation. My, my husband, is he's done two marathons. And then we got married and he's done none since. <laughs> so we have to do, like I try and fit in races. So like on our honeymoon, I did a half marathon in um, Santa Monica. So I'll like try and find, like we're going here. Let me see whether there's a race that I can combine with it. Um, we like to be quite active. So our honeymoon was like Hawaii where we did, where we went surfing and hiking and paddle boarding and snorkeling and that sort of thing um and we would go skiing so it's not always around running but it often is active what's been your favorite place that you've been to ever regardless if it was a running destination and you can't say baltimore okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know i have only been i've been to baltimore quite a few times when I was younger, we used to live it just outside Washington, D.C., and we'd go and watch the Baltimore Orioles play. Oh, nice. Um, like, a lot. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it. But I don't remember anything. The aquarium and the Orioles, that's it. That's what the that's that's pretty highlights. Much it. Yeah, that's, you hit the highlight. That's all you need. That's your travel guide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, where's my favorite place? Um, I really like New Zealand. I've got family that live there, so I've been fortunate enough to travel there quite a few times. And Hobbits? It's just beautiful. The food's amazing. The wine's amazing. Um, it's often sunny when I'm there. Um, so I'd say New Zealand and then Vietnam. I really liked Vietnam. The food was good. It was stunning, unlike anywhere I'd been before. Oh, wow. You might have to go to Vietnam, mate. What did you think about um, Charleston? South Carolina, we know you spent some time there. Loved it. The, we, yeah, we had the best time. We were there for six weeks and we stayed in downtown Charleston where you could just walk around. It was so beautiful, so historical. Again, weather was incredible because we were there from October through November, so it wasn't too hot. It was, yeah, I could live there very happily. Yeah, that's like one of my favorite cities ever. That's um, where Megan went to university. Yeah, we know... 
we know why you were in Charleston, but maybe for our audience, do you want to share a little bit more about that part of your life? Yeah. So my son was born by a surrogate um, in October of last year in Charleston. So we went over for the birth and were there until we could get him a passport to travel home. But it was, yeah, it was an incredible experience. And, and I think, you know, we fell in love with the place because it was such a magical little bubble of us and our, we saw our surrogate every kind of three days because she was pumping and we would go out to amazing dinners with her and her husband. And yeah, it was just kind of magical. That's so great. Like when I think of a surrogate, that's such a, a giving thing to do. Like, I can't even imagine like putting like it, it's in some ways, I know there's probably a financial gain to it, but it's also, it's gotta be selfless because you've only got one body and yeah. to be able to donate I, it's got, it, I know it's nine months of pregnancy, but it's, it's gotta be over a year of injections and shots and doctor visits and uh, it's, it's intense. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't get my head around it and I have been through the process in terms of like meeting Ashley and getting to know her and her family. And I, I still like when Bertie, our son was born, I burst into tears in the, it, we call it the theatre, the operating room. And I was just like, thank you. Like, thank you will never be enough to cover this. But it's, that's kind of all I have is just to say thank you, spend time with her. Like we got there, not only did she, you know, look after our son for nine and a bit months, 40 weeks, 38 actually. But um, we got there and she had bought bags and bags clothes and nappies and wipes and and I was like well this is too much and she was like well you know if Casey came early or in case you couldn't get here and I was like well there's things that for six to nine months (laughs) I was in Target it was cute and yeah she just was is the is the most incredible person I know are you guys gonna remain like close or is this is it pretty much yeah we still text like every week or so and I said photo updates and little videos like when he first laughed I sent her a video Uh, and he is getting so she hasn't left the US other than to go to Mexico when she was younger so she's getting her passport to come over for his first birthday oh wow I loved uh, your post where you had to go to the barrister for like have a witness uh, or something yeah to high court and, uh, yeah, and there's he was wearing a wig and everything because that's how you do over there. <laughs> but, um, that was so crazy. Yeah, my my husband was like, "This is the only time we're ever coming to court with him. If he is in court again, he's on his own." <laughs> Why were you in court? I think I missed this. Okay. So it, because sur- so surrogacy is, I think, much further ahead in the U.S., which is why we did it there than in the U.K. We had to apply for a parental order, which basically means that the U.K law like in the eyes of the uk government or law they see us as the parents even though we are biologically completely related to bertie it's our embryo we had to apply for this so that they see us as the parents rather than seeing ashley and her husband as the parents so that is wild it is interesting so biologically this is your child yeah and you so base yeah oh that's so crazy so all the way did she she's never been to england so you had to take your embryo all the way to the united states i didn't even know you could do that (laughs) it was during covid and so i was like i want to go to california like can i fly and they were like would you know what to do if the cryo chamber starts like you know malfunctioning and i was like yeah better you take it (laughs) (laughs) i mean the other option would be to go to the united states and extract and do all the the work there, tried, that, yeah, we, that could take we forever. Applied, we applied for a um, medical exemption visa during COVID and it got denied. So it was either wait for, at that time, we had no idea when the borders would be opening again. It was either wait or do it in the UK and ship it over. So we just decided to to go down that route. So did you always know, uh, you were not capable of, of, uh, birthing your own child. So it wasn't like you just were like, I'd rather somebody else do this. This was a, a last resort for you. Did you at 
ever in in your you know life just resign yourself that you would not be able to have children or did you always kind of have an idea that this might be a route you would go so I was diagnosed with something called MRKH when I was 17. And so it's something that I've researched for years and knew that this was an option. Financially, it is it is expensive and we're really lucky that we've had some family support for it. So it's something that I almost think is easier if you have, you know, I've had, had 15 years to come to terms with it and financially to save up for it and know what was going to happen to a certain extent um so no I never kind of got thought I'm not going to have kids I always thought this is this is how I'm going to have kids if I'm lucky enough to find the right person be able to afford it that sort of thing um and I mean I think I also was have thought okay if that doesn't happen or if that doesn't work then I look go down the adoption route but I think that it's for anyone going through infertility, the a lot of people, not a lot of people, but some people are like, well, why don't you just adopt? And it's just not, it's not a, if not this, then that. It's, yeah. I think- You have to have it in your heart. 100%. And, and it's something that I would love to be able to do. I just know it's a completely different ball game. You need to have a a massive support system it needs to be you need to it's, you shouldn't I don't think you should go into adoption thinking I haven't been able to have bi- my own biological children therefore I'll definitely just do this I think it's something that needs to be done with the right yeah the right attitude the right support the right finances the right kind of environment and um going down the having a biological child was always my first choice and so yeah I'm incredibly lucky that it all worked out so well for us why at 17 were you getting diagnosed with like like was there an issue that people should look out for that they'll know or is this oh you'll know you basically just um I was getting a lot of cramps and it's it basically is that you just don't get your period properly so you because you don't the uterus doesn't develop so you don't menstruate properly so I was like I have ovarian cysts, so they were bursting and I was in agony, but oh. I couldn't work out what was happening. So yeah, went um went to the doctors, they didn't know, went to the hospital. Turns out I went to the hospital I went to when I was 17 was the centre for MRKH in the whole of the UK just oh, wow. happened to me. So they knew almost immediately what it was. Whereas I think if I had been at any regional hospital, they would have had no idea what they were dealing with. Um, so you so really lucked in, out. Yeah, one in five thousand women have it, but just I, I'd never heard of it. And now sharing it online, the amount of people that have messaged me being like, "Oh, I've also got it." And it took me ten years to tell anybody because it was I was so embarrassed and so huh. um, ashamed of it. Whereas this moment I started talking about it, the support from friends, from family, from complete strangers has been incredible. And then being able to be that support for some of the younger girls getting diagnosed has been really rewarding. And then it's also heartbreaking to speak to much older women who are like, this wasn't really like IVF wasn't really an option in my day. So I they don't have kids and they're like, it's lovely to see you being able to create a family. And it's yeah, it's heartbreaking that for them that just the science wasn't ready for them. So when you got diagnosed when you were 17, did you have to, um, I guess, get eggs out then? No, and I wish I sort of wish I had, but they don't do it then because the it's better to have embryos. So they say to you, just wait until you're kind of ready. And again, like at what point in a relationship do you bring that up to <laughs> yeah. future partner being like, Hey, do you wanna go and do this now? Like second day. So it Don't worry, we won't have the kid until later. But let's get <laughs> yeah, it going. Yeah. Get everyone else. Um but so it it wasn't until after my husband and I were married that we then froze our embryos. And actually we waited until we were like, we're ready to have a baby. I think that mentally we just needed to be in that place rather than going through the emotions and the hormones of IVF 
knowing, you know, I don't know whether we would have been ready to do that 28, 25, whenever. Um, so yeah, we just did it at a time that was, that felt right for us, which was, I think I was like 32. Mm. How long was the process from when you decided you wanted to freeze your embryos to having your child? It was two and a half years, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Two and a half years. And I'm thinking all the people who tuned in for a running thing, you didn't know you were going to get this, but (laughs) here's some extra information for you. So enjoy that run if you're running. Don't you think this happens on the run is that you're, you can talk to people and you find yourself going like down tangents. And, and I always think it's easier to talk to your running friends because you don't have to look them in the eye always. Like you can uh-huh. run side by side and you can tell them things that you probably don't open up with and share with other people when you're sitting and having a coffee. Well, I, I also think, you know, when you're running, you kind of suffer together. You all know what it's like to have to take a piss in the middle of a run or something like that or have stomach aches or cramps or other disgust chafing. You know, like I, I'm posting my pictures and I'm bleeding through a singlet and I'm like, that's normal. Other people, you know, friends who don't run, they're like, geez, what the hell was happening there? Um, yeah. you know, it's like, but I think that we're kind of, we, we have this shared um, life experience that bonds us. Like it's not just the eye because I could I could look in the eye and say <laughs> a lot of weird stuff, but it's it's I think it's just that you know that you're in a safe zone with runners like like nobody ever I've never gotten done with a run and someone said wow man that was really weird I don't think I'll run with you again. <laughs> <laughs> no true yeah yeah Are you like oh sorry I'm just doing a snot rocket or oh yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna um, duck behind yeah, these bushes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do think there's yeah, there's like a forced vulnerability when you're out there running. There's also like endorphins going. And I think, like you said, the lack of eye contact where you just sort of dispel probably more than you would than if you weren't out there running together. Yeah. Or in a marathon, you're so like or long run. You're so like emotionally vulnerable sometimes that uh-huh. you're just like, um, yeah, I feel like it is a different it's a different connection with with runners than it maybe would be with some with some other people. I also and, it, like- and the barriers go so quickly. Like the you know you're the first run together, you're like, oh hi, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Maybe well, you would wait for some of the uh, things you talk about uh-huh. with runners, like bowel movements. And- <laughs> I mean, that's why I'm never surprised when I see like because we have running groups, and when you see two runners uh, fall in love, it's like. Well, there's nothing to hide. like, you know, everything about that person after a couple of runs. It's not like you need to date a year and figure this out. You're like, OK, that's what, you know, they do. But the other thing is, I think a lot of us love the distraction. Mm-hmm. So like if you're telling me your story, I'm not thinking about my breathing. I'm not thinking about that. And I can just listen to you. And then I'm like, the more she talks, the less I have to work because she she, yeah. she won't start running too fast. <laughs> yeah you can catch your breath because you, that you, you ask open-ended questions and then yeah. they have to <laughs> a, 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 anytime I'm running with someone, they're running too fast. I just ask them a, like a very involved question and let them go. So they slow down. <laughs> okay. So, you know, we're really big shoe and gear nerds. So got to ask you what's, what's the favorite shoe right now? What are you running in? So I'm mostly running easy and I'm wearing the Brooks ghost 15 a lot at the moment um i am trying out the hoka rocket x2 as like uh-huh. a faster shoe um but i'm gonna be honest most of it is pretty slow at the moment and then the i just got the really pretty pink hoka clifton nines which i took out this morning which um felt very lightweight and comfy i think the the 15, the Brooks Ghost 15 are my current fave shoe, though. Oh, wow. Okay. What do you typically race in? Um, the Vaporflies. Not the Alpha Flies, the Vaporflies? No. I've got a pair of Alpha Flies that I bought in the sale recently that I was like, oh, when I run fast, I'll quickly put these on. But, um, yeah, I just feel like, I haven't tried to run fast in any anything really um, for a while. So the last 
marathon that I raced would have been 2019 and I wore Vaporflies then but it was before the Alpha Flies so and then other than that I've just like I ran three marathons just for fun so I ran in the A6 um Nova Blast that mm-hmm. I actually that I really liked and then I wore the Hoka Carbon X for one of them um and then mm, the other that was a rough choice yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that one. <laughs> no, it was not. The Rocket not X2 ideal. is really good. Yeah. But. And I've, I've, I ran, ran a 5K last week, like trying to run somewhat fast. Just well, to I, see what you could I, do. I did the same with my friend. I was like, so what's going on in your love life? Okay, let's go. And he was yeah. like, blah, blah, blah. Like, okay, great. Um, and then I, because I did London and then Chicago straight after each other, I actually ran Chicago in Brooks ghost because I was like I need basically mm. slippers at this stage and yeah it was very comfy but that's now when, you're, you're that's, gonna... that's when we saw you in London is when you were doing the back-to-back yeah yeah and you're gonna have to knock the rust off if you're going to Valencia which means getting sleep with a little one yeah that's a rough call Can you have a word with him he's doing <laughs> he, uh, basically I would be fine if I went to bed at 8 p.m. because mm-hmm. he sleeps through to about 3.45. Pr- like That's pretty good. Solidly. Yeah. Um, and then he does usually go back to sleep until about 6. So he'll wake up and then go back to sleep for a bit. But, okay. Um, I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to wish this on you, but we're going to check in with you right before Valencia because I guarantee the week before Valencia, he will come down with every <laughs> cold and snot thing. It just it, everybody I know who has a kid, this is what happens. The kid gets a cold yeah. the, as soon as you go into taper. However, you know what also always happens to people that come on this show? Oh. They always have a great performance after they come on the drop. That so is true. I just got to say, you are in for it now. You're, yeah, you might win Valencia yeah. at this point. I mean, you'd be there with Emma Bates and uh, Kira D'Amato. <laughs> And some Perfect. of the other people that we've had on that have all PR'd right after being on the show. So I am a similar caliber as them when I'm really, you know, really in tune with the racing, but I'm just a bit off at the moment because of the baby. But um, well, you got to eat up no, them no, piglies or whatever they're called. P- Percy pigs. So Percy pigs. <laughs> um, so I, I'm actually putting. So I'm going back to work in September, in October, putting him into like daycare from September. Partly, I was like, I'm not doing an October race because I need to. We need to get over that first bout of the like sickness that comes back from daycare. Mm-hmm. Really, like, give myself a few months to have all of those. I hope. Um, and then Dece- by December, I'm hoping we're in a bit of a groove with like daycare and work and sleep and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, what's your BQ time you're shooting for? Three thirty-five. Sub, well, sub 335. And when and where is your PR? Edinburgh from 2019. The last marathon I actually raced was 338. Okay. All right. All right. So we're kicking it down a yeah. notch. And are you going to... <laughs> Look at the deep breath. Do you have you a didn't coach see that or work with someone or or do you just do your own training? Hal Higdon. Oh, yeah. No. So um, I work with my friend Ash, who's done my coaching since... 2017 since we actually met in Boston I got Adidas gave me a bib that year to um help complete the marathon majors which is very kind of them and since being there I was like right I need to get back here with my, with a BQ but um so yeah she's been writing my um training plan since then and I've PR'd in like every distance in nice. that time and then in fact, one fun fact was at my wedding, we did, do you do like the um, heads or tails game? No, not that I know of. Maybe we do. It's like, uh, so like you, you give the answer, two answers, and it's like heads if it's this, tails if it's that. And if you get it wrong, you sit down. If you get it right, you stay standing. And the final question was like, who has the faster 5K time? And a lot of people thought it was me, but it was at the time my husband and now my you coach Ash was like, yeah she was like you we need to get this back for you so yeah nice. I got it back a couple, like two years ago 
Um, and then I use, um, I don't know if you have the training plan, RUNNA, R-U-N-N-A. And they, I oh, use their yeah. strength training. Like it's an app. Um, I find it really good. If anyone wants to try a little plug, you can use the co- code CHARLIE. And it will give you two weeks free if you want to try the app. And it's like run coaching and strength training. You can use whatever you want to to use. I use it for the strength training. I think it's really helpful. And I just do 30 minutes two to three times a week of that. Mm. And it's R-U-N-N-A, Runna, is that what you said? Yeah. And she just, when she said Charlie, it reminded me her name's Charlie, not Runner Beans. And <laughs> I, you grew up during the era of Charlie bit my finger. So... How often do you hear that? Um, So that was like my uni was that. Um, A little bit, but not that much. Because at uni, I was called Watson by all of my friends. Ah. Um, So luckily, I I feel like I got away with it a little bit. That's too bad because like that's one of our favorites over here. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Um, Okay. (laughs) I want to see what that kid looks like now. He's got to be like I think 20, they showed him recently. 20 or he's 25. Like, he's like an adult or something. Yeah. Or he's like a teen. I wonder if he still bites people. That's so scary, isn't it? I feel like I, you forget how long has been between things. I'm like, oh, no, when I was at uni about five years ago. And then I'm like, oh, oh 15. Mm. Yeah, and that kid was probably three then. So he's like 18 or 19 now. Terrifying. Oh, it's crazy. We haven't done end of podcast questions in a All while, right, but I kind of want to do it. Okay, just... <laughs> Our last three very Wait, can easy I ask you a question yeah. about that I'm fascinated with? Okay, I do like your uh, British royalty. And uh, I just started the book uh, Spare. Are you yeah. team Harry or team not Harry? Team not Harry. But I am not reading it. I'm just like, I feel like it's just, there's so much attention on it. And I just, I'm, I was really sad when the Queen died. I feel like I'm not that into the coronation but yeah i i i feel like so much focus has been on harry and Meghan, and it annoys me that they're like oh we just want to be out of the media but here's our book and our podcast now this <laughs> <laughs> our tv show our interview with oprah yeah please don't put us on the tv though exactly i have to say if he wrote the book it's beautifully written uh, he says he wrote it but it's really well written. I, you know, he didn't. Really I'm sure write he it. has a great education, but he also reads the book on the audio uh, book, and his voice is so soothing. I would put the book on at night if I wanted to go to sleep. Like, it, yeah, it'll put you to sleep real fast. But it, it, it it's beautifully written. Except for you guys say "mommy" uh, over there. A yeah, lot. is that is that a thing? Like you say, like. Mommy is something you Baby stop say saying here. here when you're, when you Above grow six. up. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't, I call my mom, mom, not mommy. Okay. Okay. So maybe it's yeah. a him thing. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I guess he, for like, for his defense, he lost his mom when he was probably still calling her mommy. Sure. So yeah. maybe that's just like just a stop. That you, you never call them that. I don't know. I guess I, I yeah. I mean, I'll put it out here right now. Harry, if you want to tell your side of the story on our <laughs> podcast, you are welcome to come on the drop. He's definitely listening. He probably runs. <laughs> probably. I mean, I actually do have a story about Prince Harry where he used to go to the same gym that I went to in London. And I went, went like walked up the stairs in my lunch break, was going to go and run on the treadmill. And I saw him and I recognized him and I thought, oh, I think he's so-and-so's boyfriend. And so I started walking over to the rowing machines where he was rowing and his security guard had to be like, back away, please. And I was like, oh my goodness, I just thought you were a rat. Like, (laughs) I recognize you. That's that's amazing. Yeah, that's really good. That's amazing. Yeah, that's my my claim to fame is like his bodyguard is like, "Um, ma'am, please move. So good. All right. Hit her with some final questions, Meg. Okay. I think you might have already answered this one, but headphones or no headphones on a solo run? Really depends on the mood. A lot. I'm doing a lot of no headphones at the moment. Okay. What's your go-to race mantra or tactic when the marathon gets really hard? One day you won't be able to do this. Today is not that day. 
I like that. Hey, but with the headphone thing, you skipped one because I know she said no headphones. But I am curious of who are like musical taste. So if you give us like, if you are going to use music or what, a podcast, what, what do you will be your to? playlist? Podcast or audiobook, definitely rather than rather than music. And you're always listening to the Drop podcast, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably, but no Taylor Swift, nothing like that. Um, I did listen to a lot of Taylor Swift on during one marathon, and it was. I didn't think it was possible, but it was too much Taylor Swift. Was, <laughs> That's not possible. <laughs> That's amazing. Over here, if Megan would listen to Taylor Swift on repeat. Wait, but you listened to it during the during the race. Yeah. Oh wow! And okay. so I was like, everything feels awful, and. I actually couldn't listen to Taylor Swift for a little bit after that because I feel like the negative association. <laughs> she ruined your marathon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's yeah. fair. Okay, you can go on now. But actually, what I used to do is I used to get my husband to make me playlists so that, like, during the marathon, I I would listen to songs that he had picked, and it was like a it was when we were dating, and I thought it was like a quite a romantic thing, and it was quite a nice um, thing that he would do to be part of it. And That's then during, during one race, I was like, this is not what I want to be hearing right now. <laughs> I want, like I want power ballads and like pop and stuff that's going to be really upbeat. And it was like slow jams, electric drum and bass stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you never let him make your playlist after that? No, he did make one when I climbed Kilimanjaro and it was like called like summit day playlist. And it was basically almost like Toto Africa on repeat. <laughs> and I was like, this is perfect. Nice. He okay. sounds like a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Our final question is what is your celebratory post-race meal and or beverage? So this is like a, forget I'm a dietitian. Um, but it's Shake Shack and a Diet Coke. <laughs> All right. Wait, right. there's Shake Shacks in, in the UK? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. We've got one by our house. We could coordinate, like, you could be doing dinner and we could, it's six hours, so we could be doing, like, lunch and have Shake Shack together yep. on the next podcast. Um, <laughs> Perfect. All right, but no alcohol? I like a glass of champagne. I'm not going to say no to a glass of champagne, but... Um, I feel like I'm a bit of a lightweight anyway, and then put in the fact that you've had basically liquid yeah. all day from gels and Lucozaid, et cetera. I, the, after my first marathon, I was very unwell from having too many drinks. <laughs> <laughs> very I'm, unwell. I'm glad, <laughs> glad to say that I've learned my lesson <laughs> since then. So I have like maybe one or two glasses of champagne and then it's, yeah, electrolytes and Diet Coke. Nice. Solid. All right, Charlie, yeah. thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us today. This was super fun to hear a little bit more about you. And um, It's got to be like midnight there. No. What is it, six? No. Yeah. Five past four. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. We can't do math at all over yeah. here. <laughs> hey, well, um, you, did, you did good maths in the, in the email that you sent me saying like okay. 3 p.m. So there we yeah, go. That was I, nice. I knew at one point what we were doing. Awesome. But yeah, so we're excited for you and it'll be fun to see your journey to Valencia for that BQ. We'll be rooting for you. And um, and I do feel like if you do BQ, you owe us at least uh, <laughs> something. You, know, you got to sure. yeah. give us a shout out when you cross the finish line. You're like, yes, I was on their okay, podcast. Yeah. Success. I, I will try and remember that. <laughs> All right, great success. <laughs> All right, thanks, Charlie.